All right, so equity. Equity, equity, equity. What is equity? How does it work? So equity, I'm just going to call it equity because that's what it's called in poker. Effectively. I mean, it's, it's slightly different if you want to be a smart ass. But it's your win percentage at any given point in time. So, uh... Okay. What that's going to mean is that literally as soon as the game starts, you have an invisible win percentage in your head that is always going to be somewhat of an estimation, somewhat, and you're going to have to be understanding like how that swings. Take this spot for example. Before making a single decision, we see our pre-mulligan hand and we see Freljordania, which means elusives. Now we're favored in that matchup, so our equity starts off pretty high. And we've got a good opener too. I'll call this 70%. Um... Uh, let, let's say 67%. Let's say two-thirds, okay? And the thing to understand is that... Do you mulligan sentry in this matchup? I guess you might. The thing to understand is, like, as this changes, it's always it's always something to be aware of, right? So we just drew two fairly weak cards in the opener here. So, for example, and, and, and he just played Blade Scout, right? So, again, it's shifting. The fact that we drew two cards that aren't really what we want to see in the early game... Bumps us down, like, you know, let's say to 64%. The fact that he didn't play Omen Hawk on turn one is good. That bumps us up, you know, let's say to 66% or something like that, right? But the point to understand is, like, it doesn't matter the exact number. It's not really about the exact number. It's about understanding generally where you're at, where your opponent's at, and making sure you're playing accordingly, right? So here we drew Archer, we're up a little bit more. I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm just going to talk about the big swings when they happen. I'm not going to talk about, like, little things. I'm not going to do, like, plus one, minus one kind of stuff. <clears throat> Basically, so you might ask, why does this matter? The reason why this matters is because you are going to play based on... A, you're going to make decisions based on your percentage to win the game at any given point in time. And that's going to be stuff like, for example, when you're really unfavored, you need to take risks. When you're really ahead, you want to play super safe, right? In general, right? That's uh, important with hand reading as well. When you're really, really far behind in terms of your equity, when you're like 30% or lower, you're going to want to basically assume they don't have X card in their hand, which is a risk. When you're really far ahead, you assume they do have an answer in their hand, which is like playing a safe. And you'll sacrifice value to maintain consistency, right? Because the, the idea of... Um, the probability you have of winning each, uh, ba basically any, any form of randomness will sort of gravitate the win rate towards 50% from either direction, right? I think that's a kind of an easy way of thinking about it. So this is like a fairly big swing. You know, he plays the Z out, we're good on Archer and we're slowing him down at pace. So I'll, I'll say we're at 70% right now. Again, it's not, it's not really about the, the micro. It's just about the broad picture, right? So we do Mystic Shot. It's actually not very useful in this matchup because they always have Elixir of Iron. Um, and we're ready to just basically develop our tools here. Time to Bull Elnuck. We've got a pretty decent open attack, but I think this attack will probably only improve with the Bull Elnuck. Um, like, he'll, he'll play something that can block decently. If he plays, like, a Kinku Wayfinder, then suddenly both of these attacks get quite disabled. You know, I'm pretty far ahead because I'm at, like, 70%, so maybe I don't want to take a bit of a risk. If he plays Wayfinder, that gives us the Mystic Shot, though, and that's going to be pretty good for us because we'll be able to Mystic Shot when he can't use Elixir of Iron. So I'll take the Bull Elnuck here. That'll allow us to get a free Mystic Shot on either the Zed or the Conspirator, whichever one we favor. And the Bull Elnuck development is only really punishable by the Kinko Wayfinder as opposed to the open attack with Avros and Sentry and Iceville Archer, right? The only punishment to developing this instead of open attacking is Kinko Wayfinder, which based on our hand, we're looking at Mystic Shot, we're looking at a rare opportunity to get it in when he doesn't have mana for um, Elixir if he plays the Kinko. So because of all that, we can open develop, no problem. Okay, now, looks like a pretty easy full swing. Um, no problems here. What does open attack mean? Uh, attack on first action of your turn. Okay, so he's pretty afraid of our aggression, which is great here. He's going to sacrifice a lot of his things along the way. In this case, I could use, like, Brutal Steel to, you know, effectively generate, like, a 3-1. Not going to be worth it here. Land blockers aren't a big priority in the elusive matchup. But yeah, so the idea is we're pretty far ahead, right? And it really, it really pays to think about equity. What's another way equity matters? Well, it really, really, really helps for the idea of card evaluation, right? 
like a lot of the times when you play a big card, like I was talking about that like Green Glade Caretaker play a few games ago, where it's like it looks flashy, but in reality, my win percentage was already really high before that. It was already like what, like eighty? Let, let's say eighty-five percent. Let's just say, which might be a little high. Who knows? And then afterwards, it ended up being um, like 88%. So it's like plus 3%. That's okay. That's not bad, but that's not really like a crazy level swing. And cards are literally only as good as, or bad as they can swing your equity. Period. Like st straight up. There's nothing else. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I can Marksman. That'll usually just force out an Elixir of Iron. But since he has one in spell mana, we're never going to get him to tap out that anyway. Um... Yeah, forcing out an elixir of iron is kind of fine. Hear that? One of the that, that's the one saving grace in his matchup to mine, by the way, which is that it is literally impossible for me to really deny elixir of iron value. There, that card will always hit premium value. So the fact that he didn't use it, I think, should indicate that he straight up doesn't have it. So our win percentage is spiking right now. It's crazy high. This guy doesn't have Kinku. He doesn't have Omen Hawk. He apparently doesn't have elixir of iron, which is also crazy. And we have like the nut draw in a favored matchup. So I'm going to put that at like 88% right now. So again, that's going to make us want to play super, super, super safe. Because we don't want to take risks when we're already at 88%. Again, now you, you might say, Swim, these numbers are a little ass -pulled. Honestly, these are a bit ass -pulled, yes. When I, when I talk about like the probability that he'll have X card in his hand, that's a lot more objective. When you're talking about equity... There, there is like some, there's, there's mathematical backing to that, but a lot of it is just kind of like gut based on playing the game, card games, this matchup, this deck a lot, right? Like there's, it's a lot harder to refine that into like a super exact science. So here, uh, we'll take a mystic shot on this. I think that's pretty easy. Apparently he doesn't have the uh, elixir that he needs. Keeping this up is fine, because we've got outs for, like, Static Shock in our deck later. Second Marksman. There's the Static Shock odds. He drew one card, uh, and we've got Static Shock, Harsh Winds, Bull Elnuk, Chomp. I think it's a very, very easy Bull Elnuk here. We're going to open with this. This one card could be uh, Brittle Steel, or, sorry, Elixir of Iron. And most importantly, we want to play outside of, like, the mana for Deny. So he's got two cards that could be uh, Elixir of Iron... I don't know. Trying trying to avoid deny mana is like really really important. It's like it's actually so important. And he doesn't really have great blocks, I think for for our attack. I think I will just swing in big here. I think this is a totally fine swing. He shouldn't feel very comfortable getting rid of the elusives here. Like he he will get one good trade off the blade scout and that's fine. I could choose to brittle steel, but I think like a 4/2 is actually not going to do that much here. So that's totally fine. We're playing for odds for our Static Shock. Again, our win percent is high, so we're going to take a safety play. We're going to try to, like, disable his Deny or make him lose mana, right? Wow. He's going to go ahead and pass there. See, again, like, look, look at that play. It would have been higher value to Static Shock, the Duo, and the Blade Scout, but he's playing a clunked up hand. We put him on having no Wayfinder. We put him on having no Elixir of Iron. Uh, he, he just drew two cards that could be Elixir of Iron, but he's on a super clunked up hand. Look at how he's playing. The odds of him having Deny are spiking like crazy. Like crazy. And look at that pass too. Like super, super high odds for Deny. At the very least, we need him to like force him to keep the mana open if he wants to represent that Deny further. And that's really important, okay? And again, because we want to play safe, because we realize our win rate is super high and we just need to make sure we're playing safe... That's going to mean that we're not going to take a weird risk like that, right? So now enter the second Static Shock draw. Suddenly we're outside of the range for a Deny. He has two cards that could be Elixir of Iron, and that's pretty nasty, because that's going to smack us for the duo, which means we'll have to Brittle Steel at that point. So it'll go like Static Shock, Deny into Static Shock, and then if he's got the Elixir of Iron on the two top decks, then we'll move in for Brittle Steel, take four down to six. And I think I can actually survive going down to six. I think that's just okay. So I'm, I'm fine opening with Static Shock here. It doesn't really matter if we wait for the attack. So this will usually be a deny. It's like 75% chance, almost 80 actually. It's really, really high odds that this is the first deny. And now he's at two mana. Um, we'll take the real static shock here. And now odds of brutal uh, or elixir of iron pretty low, but they do exist, like 10%. The fact that he didn't have it in hand before makes that hard, but he could have just drawn it on like the two cards. 
And every card is, what, like 7.5%? Okay, and there's an Omen Hawk. And now, you know, we, we had the Brittle Steel as well. If he had the Elixir, that would have been a nice um, backup plan, right? So, he's gonna punch us up here. This is pretty scary. Um, now, we do have the ability to, you know, get some good value in with, like, Harsh Winds later. I don't think this is gonna be, like, unique value on Brittle Steel, so I won't be taking this. But now we've got to think in terms of Clock, okay. So, Clock, which is one of the other important concepts in this game, which is, like, how soon are we killing him and how soon is he killing us? It's not looking good, honestly. We're gonna have to develop here. We don't have an attack that's good enough taking. Like, these 1-1 one -one blockers are doing wonders for him. This Kinko draw spiked his win percentage. I forgot to mention that, by the way. I forgot to mention that. The Kinko draw did spike his win percentage, like, 10% or something like that. Something crazy. So, I would say we're still ahead, but this second harsh win draw actually hurts a little bit. Um, eh, no, it's, it's helpful at this point in the game. But it's not really what we need to, like, close the game out. So, there's the 6-6. Our attack is basically completely shut down here. Um, now, there's a few things to note about this situation that are really, really unique. Really, really unique. Which is, A, his board is full. Which means he can't actually generate a good uh, Like, he can't play more units. I could attack with my sentry, but I think I'm not really in a hurry to have my sentry die. And we can also start planting mushrooms. If we want to get, like, that little tiny bit of chip damage in. The chip damage isn't going to matter. We're going to be leveling on the Ezreal either way. I think we just do no attack here and chill. It's got to be a no attack here and chill. He can play Conspirator or Will. Yeah, technically true. Yes, he can play Conspirator or Will. But he can't play anything scary like Windfair Hatchling. So he'll usually be looking at like a swing here. And we've got, you know, the big freeze in our hands. We're going to need to draw like Ezreal at Progress Day soon. This game's like close to 50-50 at this point. Like, our, our draws for the past few turns have been, like, a little awkward. The second Brittle Steel was kind of the first of that. The second Brittle Steel does pretty much nothing for this hand. We really want to have, like, cards like Progress Day would spike our win percentage in a really major way, right? Look out for Reavers. There won't be a warning shot. I mean, if I take the Harsh Winds here, he could threaten Battle Fury. Battle Fury is a real scary card. Um... We do need to level the Ezreal, kind of no matter what. The three damage here doesn't really change anything at all. I think I'll take one Harsh Winds on this and this. I'll let I'll, I'll let this Omen Hawk smack me for one. I would never do this if I didn't have second Harsh Winds, because otherwise I auto lose to Battle Fury. That's really, really, really bad play to do this if you don't have, like, the answer to Battle Fury. And if he had Battle Fury, he had to move in there with it, I think. Nah, no, that's not true. I, I'm, I'm at 6. I'm at good odds for a second Arch Wins. He totally could still be on Battle Fury. So I'll do, like, double Mushroom into Thermo Beam here, I think. Could be a Will of Ionia. Will of Ionia is definitely, like, very much in his range. That could definitely be a, a bit of a mistake, honestly. Just because, like, willing his own protector is actually decent value. Yeah. That was a misplay, I think. That was just, like, time pressure. I wasn't thinking enough about the cards in his hand. Because it's, it's a little too much, like, too much value for him. I mean, if we find, like, any draw cards, like Ezreal, Progress Day, Rummage, we're pretty much good. I mean, he doesn't really have a good way to, like, over-the-top us here. Hit the Ez. And we're good. So, I don't really see how we can win now. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be quite the trick, I think. So, I, I think it's 100% at this point. I mean, I can't think of anything weird happening. Is it still 50-50? It's been no. It, it wasn't. It was never 50-50. We were always a bit ahead, but it was pretty close. We were. It, it was in like the 50 to 60 range. Again, that's my interpretation. This. This is definitely not super hard math. It. It will depend on who you're asking. 
the variance of this will be somewhat high. When, I, when I'm talking about card probabilities in hand, the margin of error on that is like 5%. But for these kinds of numbers, the margin of error is going to be like 20%. Like, different people will simply just have, like, somewhat different interpretations. It still is relevant, and it's really, really important to think about things like this. But the idea of, you know, oh, this is just how it is, doesn't really apply here, right? So here we're at 100%. And yeah, it, it came down to those last few top decks. We started off really, really high. Um, we started off already favored, like, 67%. It got boosted by no Omenhawk, no Kinko, no Brittlesteel, up to, like, 85%. And then as soon as he draw the Kinko, the Kinko hit good too. It's not just Kinko. It hit and then it hit two Omen Hawks when we had a board that was very vulnerable to a 1-1 stat line. That spiked us down to like, like high 60s again, like back to where we started. Um, and like the Shadow Assassin was really good too when he used it. Like he, he, he had a lot of answers in his hand. And while all of this was happening, we weren't drawing like Progress Day or Ezreal, which was kind of bad. Like the second Brittle Steel draw is almost useless right it's like feels feels very useless okay and then of course we're you know we're good but yeah that's i think that's that's a combination of like i want to make these into individual guides which is the idea of you know just um there's a few things going on here there is the I, I, idea of just being able to Estimate. I'm gonna say estimate because I, I don't I can't use the word calculate here. I really can't Margin of error at 20 doesn't really matter at all when you you really care about is whether you're ahead or behind For most decisions. Yes, that's exactly right. That's a very good point That's why this is still really relevant to think about the game in these terms Even if it's just somewhat estimation But yes, you always need to understand at any point of the game like whether you're behind or ahead like because it's going to be swinging. That's how that's how the game works. It's like you. It's the same thing as equity in poker, which is why I'm calling it equity in this game. It just makes sense, um, which is simply the idea of like what what my percentage to win is, what his percentage to win is, right? At any given time, it's constantly shifting. It starts the game not at fifty percent. It starts the game not at fifty percent, which is really important to understand because these are already affecting your mulligan decisions, right? So think about the game in those terms. Take risks or safe plays based on those thoughts. Like, there's a lot going on that game. The fact that we didn't take the risky play of the first static shock into his probable deny. Like, we put him on, like, a hand read of deny at, like, 70%, which is really high. So we can't take, we can't take that first static shock until we have backup. Until we either, like, drain him out of mana. We drew the second one in that case. Like, we, we because our win rate is high, we don't want to take risks. Okay. And because we had a hand read on him... It's, his odds of having deny are super, super high, all right? That's a really, really important way to start thinking about the game. And then lastly, the, the idea of clock at the end, which I, I need to make my, its own guide on for sure. I need to do like individual guides on all of this where I talk about it like more extensively, but clock just being like, you know, what the, what the threat is on their end, how, how soon they have to kill you and how soon you have to, to kill them, right? Like, the amount of turns it's going to take you. And there, our clock was weird. It was completely predicated on our top decks. It's the ability to... It's not just Ezreal. The thing is, like, drawing a progress day is pretty much a win. Um, because even if progress day doesn't hit Ezreal, which is, you know, it, it's got good odds at that point in the game. But even if progress day doesn't hit Ezreal, it's like, we're top decking, it's like Mystic Shots. Like, second second Shroom, like Mystic Shot Shroom, maybe like the one of Get Excited will usually be like a game ender there, even without Ezreal. Since he was, like, really low. So that's, that's just like, I would say those are, those are three really important lessons to think about in your game, which is the idea of equity, the idea of hand reading, and the idea of clock. I want to make a guide on these three concepts, because I think they are, they're intermediate concepts. These aren't very basic concepts. I, I guess you, hand reading you could call an advanced concept. Um, yeah, same with equity. Definitely not for, um... Clock. Clock is more of an intermediate concept, but I, I think that these are three things that will make you a much better player. None of them are, I would say, super basic, though. These are also the three things that I hear people talk about the least. 
Because I I hear a lot of people talk about, like, magic fundamentals, like, basics, like, you know, who is the aggressor, the control versus aggro kind of matchup. The idea of, you know, stuff like mana curve and card advantage, like, very just basic card game fundamental stuff. And that will that's helpful, and I want to make guides on that stuff, too. But these are three things that I don't really hear people talking about, even though they're all very, very important.